Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's Wrong with the Podcast. Today, we have the pleasure of chatting with Andy Wright. Andy is the creator of the Never Not Creative Community and co chair of the Creative Media and Marketing Industry Mentally Healthy Change Group. He's been working in the creative industry for many years. From running the local offices of global agencies like Interbrand and RGA, he was also an original co founder of For the People in Sydney. He has run successful and award-winning projects for GOMA, Australia Post, Telstra, and Streamtime. It's the latter where Andy now spends his time leading the project management software business with a mission to create healthier creative businesses as Streamtime's managing director. When not doing any of the above, you might find him somewhere in Scandinavia chasing the Aurora Borealis and a bit of peace and quiet. Welcome to our podcast. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Andy Wright, who is the creator of Never Not Creative and co-chair of Mentally Healthy. Andy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to uh, great to be here. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here, especially at 8 a.m. your time. And please tell us more about yourself as uh, for our audience. Yeah, cool. So I um, I run this community called Never Not Creative. And I guess what that needs is a little bit of sort of context of where it came from. So um, I've been in sort of marketing, creative design and branding for, I think now, what would it be? 21 years, um, getting a little bit old. Wow. <laughs> and it's, I guess, st- I've worked client side, I've worked agency side, I've, I've run agencies, I've worked in strategy, run branding projects and spent a lot of time in this kind of creative industry and the I guess it's sort of the experiences of one you know at times not knowing what I'm doing two you know understanding that that's probably affected other people in the past three watching other people be affected by like the conditions and when I say conditions in our industry it's not like we're you know it's not a sweatshop (laughs) although maybe maybe sometimes yeah (laughs) um but it can certainly be better. And the, I guess a lot of the time, like the effects on people's mental health and well-being um, are quite severe. And so um, a couple of years ago, I started this, this thing called Never Not Creative. Um, and I'd, I'd sort of, I'd just uh, come out of running, uh, co-running an agency that I'd started with, with two other founders. And I'd actually gone to work for one of my clients. So I now run a software company but that, um, called Streamtime. The, but still is a supplier to the industry. So we do creative bit product, project management software. Uh, but what it, what it gave me was like a lot more headspace because I didn't have, you know, I didn't have clients for one. We have lots of customers, but um, when you're in software, it's a little bit easier to sort of keep them at arm's length when you, when yeah. you need to. And, um, and, you know, essentially software is, is one size fits all. So there's none of this sort of, you know, demands mm. and, and back and forth. And, but it did, it exposed me to like, thousands more agencies and how they work which was really interesting because you know it's well i'll tell you one th- funny thing which is often like we'll talk to an agency um and they'll go but you know we need this uh because like every agency does this yeah. and you'd be surprised <laughs> you know a lot of <laughs> agencies do the same thing but they do it in very different ways it's quite interesting um and so that ex- that exposure was good um the experiences of understanding you know i've, I've been in agencies where sometimes like I, I know people who had ulcers because of um the stress that they were under at work and you know we gave them time off we said look take as long as you need but we didn't change anything we put them straight back into that situation of you know what caused it in the first place so never not creative was started to address these gaps in the industry that we just kind of sit and take um and even like to be honest in a in a morbid way we laugh at it sometimes as a way of just kind of getting yeah. through it i think which is oh you know i went to another weekend oh i can't come out for dinner because i'm working till midnight yeah. um or you know i'm just feeling really stressed or i'm burnt out like we, i went to a um there's a great conference over here called the design conference and one year literally i don't think there was a speaker that didn't talk about burnout at some point um yeah. and so you know this this kind of topic um, and I'd had my own experiences with with um, poor mental health. Um, and I was like, okay, well, let's see whether I can help do something about this. And so Never Not Creative addresses the, the gaps in our industry that other people aren't addressing. So one is 
um, mental health, two is internships and giving people the best possible start in their career because it's also poorly structured and managed and you know exploitative in some cases. Making sure people get the value um, in design, like you know, cr creatives aren't great at asking for money or getting paid as as much as what they're worth. Yeah. Um, and then and diversity and inclusion. And so there, there is, you know, more work being done around diversity and inclusion, but I think, you know, we can tackle that in a unique way, which we can talk about later as well. But um, it's, yeah, so that's sort of where it came from. And from there, you know, we did this massive piece of research into mental health in the creative industries, which sparked um, what you mentioned earlier, which is mentally healthy. And so we, yeah. we launched mentally healthy out of that. And uh, yeah, I guess we can get into the detail throughout the conversation, but that's sort of what's been, going on for me it creates uh it keeps me busy uh, yeah which is good like i i love uh you uh turned your personal experience that you know probably gave you migraines and headaches and uh panic attacks into something that is useful for the entire industry um so let's talk about uh you know obviously like we're talking about the symptoms of the problem, right? Like, you know, stress, um, poor mental health, um, ulcers apparently, and many other, what are the underlying reasons of like us really, the creative industries have created um, this stressful environment for ourselves? Like why, I mean, we know like what, you know, most of the stress comes with is like the rush timelines. Everybody wants everything yesterday. And this comes actually from the client. So the agency feels responsible and you're just like pushing the engine. Um, but how did that happen? How did we come here? You know, like you, you can't sort of say that in a, uh, let's say a medical R and D facility. Like I want this prototype by tomorrow, you know, like <laughs> that's not going to happen. How did that, how did we allow that for ourselves in the creative fields? Although amazingly, I think the medical industry may just turn around at the moment and say, that's exactly what we did. <laughs> what happened last year? <laughs> yeah. Before Corona, after Corona medical industry. Yeah. Uh, so look, yes. Uh, so the, the biggest stressor that we found in our research and this, this piece of research was done, oh, so we've done two waves now. And this piece of, piece of research was done with uh, a, a government agency in Australia. So we, we have, it wasn't me on Survey Monkey. Um, it was us working with proper academics and making sure that, you know, all the kind of statistical differences and significance and stuff in the data is, is worked out and the models are there. So it's a very robust piece of research. Um, we found that more than half of the industry were showing signs of anxiety and depression. Um, and that's like mild to severe. And actually, I think almost a quarter were showing severe signs. And so <clears throat> that really sort of brought it home for people. I think we all knew that there was a problem, like anecdotally, but this really brought it home for people. And so then uh, you know, doing the, this research allows us to get into a little bit more of like why, what's happening. And so we, we have this like chart of the top stresses in our industry. And this is where it gets quite interesting. Uh, because the top stressor is the pressure that you put on yourself. Okay. And so whilst that is an answer, there's obviously like a lot going on around that. Some people will write that off as going, oh, creatives, they're all a little bit, mm, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> you're creative, like <laughs> you've got to be a little bit unstable or, you know, you've got to have these wacky ideas or you've got to have these moments of like zaniness yeah. Um, which you know actually you don't and so that that sort of argument gets written off and but but i think like you talked about it at the beginning there which was what's created it and i actually think whilst that comes up as the number one thing in our research it is the culture that we've created that has led to us putting that pressure on ourselves right um so we are constantly told to look up for inspiration you know look around like Who's doing great work? Who do you want to be like? Who do you admire? Um, and then we have social media where we put the work out there and it's like, ah, oh, you know, didn't get as much likes on that piece. Or, you know, I'd stuck for, for brand designers. I put my um, latest piece of work up and it got torn apart on, you know, a website and the comments section and, and this kind of stuff. Like we're incredibly cruel industry at times to ourselves. And, but at the same time, we're never we don't do an amazing job of celebrating, right? Like if you've just launched right. a piece of work, 
you don't look back and go, bloody hell, that was good. And at the same time, like, you know, you, there is a fair amount of perfectionism, which comes from all of this sort of culture. And so you're always looking at like, oh, you know, now I see it. You, you can always see the flaws in your own work, right? Yeah. Um, and yet nobody else knew that. Like nobody else <laughs> knew that it was meant to do this or it was meant yeah. to look like that. It's only you. But, but that's kind of what we teach. Now, you could argue that produces amazing work and it has done, right? Um, but ama imagine how more amazing the work could be if you didn't have those sort of restrictions around you and those kind of like the tightness around having to produce that, that kind of work. Um, I've worked in studios and we were talking about this the other night with a, with a friend we worked together 10 years ago and we talked about how we had this like manifesto of just everything all basically had to be world changing work. And we did like that team produced world changing work for three, four, five years in a row, but it wasn't sustainable. It was so extreme. It's like an extreme sport at times. Right. right? And so right. you don't want this to be a career that you can manage for four or five years and then retire. Cause then what you do, it'd be like sports. You go and start doing punditry and commenting on the industry and you know, like exactly. it's just not, <laughs> not sustainable. I don't think there's a lot of money in that. And so, um, so we, we, we have to find this better balance. And I think, you know, what's starting to happen is that people have been through that. And now rather than we're starting to hear a lot more of this, isn't a badge of pride anymore, right? This, this burnout, this late nights that I think in the slightly older generations, it is like, Oh, I did it. You know, you should be able to do it. Or you, you know, yeah. you think you're working hard now. It's nothing like we had back then. Uh, yeah. But now, it's starting to change because that the the sort of the generation slightly after that that did go through it realized that it's not ideal and i don't want my own people now to have to go through that yeah. so that's that has has all sort of led to this like pressure and it's not to say that you shouldn't push yourself but you have to push yourself at the times that you're enjoying it not at the times yeah. when you start to resent it because that resentment can, then comes into the burnout and burnout isn't just, Oh, you've worked loads of hours and you're tired. There's a lot of research around burnout where actually it's, it's also because you're just not feel, finding fulfillment in your work anymore. And right. that's when it starts to become, because that's when resentment creeps in and that's when it's just too, you know, it's like, what's the point? And you don't want to get to that, that point in your, in your work where you go, what's the point? Um, there are definitely other uh, reasons. So there are other things like, um, you know, multiple responsibilities is very near the top of the list. Um, we are not like as a, it's funny as professional services, which is essentially where, you know, creative industry should fall into. Uh, it does lack a bit of professionalism, right. You know, and, and also yes. the ability to, to, to make money. Like you wouldn't, you, the management consultancies, accountants, lawyers, you pay for every single bit of their time. Right. You go for a, go for a chat with one. You pick up the phone, the clock starts creative industries. No, nah, how are you doing? Yeah, no, it's good. Oh, you know, why, why don't I put something together for you? Like see whether, you know, we could, we could work together. Um, and you know, it's, Oh, I wonder how I can get a foot in the door with this client. How can I get a foot in the door with this agency? And it's, it's all like, you'll do whatever you can to win the work and to get people to like you. Um, but then what it does, it just, it takes away the time that you have to actually do the work later and to get paid and to be in the position that you need to be. And so, so that creates a lot of challenges. Um, and then, and then we just are always trying to do more and more and more. And I think a lot of creatives would probably say that their ambitions many of the times are, are bigger than their clients. So you're right. pouring yourself into this work. Um, whereas the clients just like, yeah, great. That's done off my plate. Let's get on to the next project. Um, yeah. Not, not in all cases, but there is a, a certainly a little bit of that. Yeah. I mean, I'm like hearing all these like keywords, like self pressure restrictions, um, and, uh, multiple like responsibilities. And like a lot of it also is like, just, you know, the market drives it, right? Like we are now, uh, like, cultures of instant gratification and consumerism so we're the more we consume the more we're expected uh, expecting to see content and that content is created by so it's like a it's like a trickle down effect right and then yeah. because there is like more seasons or uh, products and whatnot there are tighter budgets for each um you know i guess creative project and therefore agencies need more um projects in order to 
you know, be able to sustain the team. And that also then affects like how the team is paid and how the interns are paid or not paid. And it's just like, it just never ending. Like it starts from and then it trickles down to all points. And also like, I guess what you mentioned in terms of self pressure, and I guess like this can go back to even like how we were raised, but also like societal mm-hmm. pressure on, um, and you know, we see this more in even women, especially working moms and you know, expectations on them. And there's reasons why, you know, in the field of architecture or, you know, in creative agencies, we don't necessarily see a lot of women that have multiple children, right? And um, it sort of then goes into the issues around inclusion and representation in uh, fields. And I think, you know, um, obviously with like COVID, if there's any silver lining, it just brought in a little bit more transparency into our own lives. So like, in the past, we had to be super professional on how we present ourselves. And then we, now we're having like Zoom calls with our cats and dogs and children, which I, it's, it was actually for the betterment of everyone, right? Like we realized like, oh wait, we're human first. Um, and then we're uh, working, but then that also came with additional pressure. We actually started to be more efficient and work more because we're not traveling between meetings now. We can go back to back meetings. Um, and then also like we, we actually did, um, diary studies with seven moms and sort of try to understand like, how did this like work from home and school from home change their, uh, entire setup. And so many of them, um, said something around like everybody else seemed to figure it out. Like I'm, Mm -hmm. I still didn't figure it out. So these like self thoughts that we actually are thinking and holding ourselves accountable to Mm. standards that we can't necessarily meet well everybody probably didn't figure out their own system it just looks as such right so the marketing um, exactly there is the there is the veneer like especially as well in in our industry the creatives there's the veneer of you've got it all worked out Whereas actually inside there's, it's turmoil. It's like that classic sort of, you know, duck on the lake. Oh, it's everything's yeah. great and fine, but the legs are, you know, manically uh, going underneath. And I think, you know, that is a big one. And it was good that we got to see into people's lives. I think the other big thing was that it was, it created a bigger sense of trust, right? True. Like before companies didn't want their employees to work from home because they thought they were yeah. just going to take the piss. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you're going to work from home, you're going to watch TV for a bit, then you're going to, you know, have another tea and a coffee. It's like, ironically, that probably, you know, happens more at work the tea, the coffee, exactly. the outside for a <laughs> smoke break, like whatever, whatever it is. Um, and yes, I think people worked harder. A lot of people I know would say that they're so much more productive. Um, more social people certainly would miss, <clears throat> more social people certainly would miss the, um, the, the like the physical and social yeah. interaction for sure um but ultimately yeah i think like now businesses can trust their employees a lot more you know and yeah. oh you know what we made it work and it was forced upon them you know it wasn't yeah. just now it, it just you had to do it and they had what? to do it yeah it which so our also, business yeah we which just moved pissed out off of our so office. many people who like weren't allowed the access when they really needed and now, oh see you could actually do it yeah and I, I think you mentioned a really important point, which is hopefully now actually employers have realized that life is more important than work and we have to organize our work around life. Yeah. And I see that in a lot of cases, like, you know, in our own business, it, it, it has to be like that. Like, you're now at home, you can actually contribute more to the family as well. Yeah. And, you know, if you need to take your kids swimming lessons at 10 a.m. in the morning, great. You can now yeah. do it. Go do it. Um, yeah. and, and, and all of that, that kind of stuff. Because as, as long as you get through the work, like, it doesn't matter. And so, it, it, you know, we, for a long time, we've sort of um, judged productivity and output on how much time you spend at your desk. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, you know, it's all of these hours. And I work for a you know, piece of software that helps you track hours to understand how much money you're you know, making, mm-hmm. but that's not really the, the measure of, you know, success and output um, of your productivity. It's, it's the work that comes out at the end uh, rather than how many hours you sat at your computer. Now, when you people are in the office together, we can see 
Um, there are some bigger companies that track how many hours literally at home right. spending at your computer, right? Like they have software on the systems yeah. tracking that stuff, um, which is just, I mean, horrendous. Uh, but so, so, but I think, you know, what the pandemic has done is just helped businesses realize that, yeah, there are other things that are more important that we can give a little bit more and that we can, like you said, we can see a little bit more, can't we, of what people's lives are like. And you know what, guess what? They're like ours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> you, you walk into work and go, right, everyone's got to be professional, blah, blah, but I've got all this shit going on at home and you know, <laughs> this and that. Uh, but I don't need to let anyone know about it. I need to look like, you know, I'm in charge and I'm running things, you know, efficiently and brilliantly. Um, yeah. And it's just, yeah, it doesn't Which, like, happen. think of the amount of stress that comes with that, like, pseudo personality, right? Like, I yeah. think what you said earlier on, you know, if you feel like you're in a streak or, you know, you do feel passionate about, maybe you do want to work until, like, 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. anyway, but it's in your control. I think when yes. it starts becoming, like, a huge stress factor is when you know, like, you have to do it and you don't really feel like doing it. And the worst may be you don't believe in the work. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, like, you know, I, I like for like as a mom with a toddler, I always thought like, okay, like bedtime is important for me. I don't want to miss bedtime. So I try to avoid any situation that will allow for that. So like between, you know, 6 to 9 uh, p.m., I'm not going to work. But if I want to work until 3 a.m. in the morning afterwards, I, I will if I want to. So I think having more control over your own scenario, like you said, like take your children to swimming class and then work, you know, but ha like to be able to create that already creates so much relief and um, like freedom of like guilt or like imbalance or all of these things that are sort of eating you up, which you can't show at work. I think that is sort of something that, as you said, like employers could live, realize that they could live with actually. And also to what you said in terms of like, you know, liking the work or loving the work really and believing in it, it started to even like, with I think millennials and more like Gen Z and onwards, I think it's becoming even more and more important that there should be a reason why we're producing something, right? Like we're not, so like I can see somebody feeling burnt out or find their work meaningless when they feel like we're just putting out an ad for maybe, I don't know, cigarette brands, let's say like for the millionth time, um, like why are we doing this? Like, is this meaningful? But like, if you see like there's a bigger cause or reason to what you're working on, it's it, then you can feel more passionate about it. Like, I don't know how, like it, in your experience also, you probably worked on a million projects where you were kind of like, eh. So like, did you feel like in those moments or like through the network that you have, do you see in those moments, like those are the biggest, like maybe I guess in, like uh, culprits on, you know, stress factor? Yeah, I think, and you know, there's a bit of a dynamic in our industry, which is, and in fact, a friend of mine started a, an agency, which was named based on this dynamic, actually, which is like, it's love and or money. Um, right. And so you, there's some things you do for love and then you do them and you don't get paid as well. And then there's some things you do for money, which you really don't love, but you get paid better. Right. And <clears throat> I think trying to teach people that it doesn't have to be that way is a big is a big thing right like i know there's there's an element of reality about it but it is the stuff that actually businesses choose to do for the money is the stuff that often wrecks the team and so mm. you have to work out how to make good money out of the things that you love doing right it shouldn't be a, an either or and so you know the big things that people got burnt out on were like you know huge projects for telecommunications businesses where it was like once you've done the exciting stuff there's just all this rollout of, of stuff and it just it, it created so much um just like a, an overwhelming amount of work that wasn't particularly challenging um or fulfilling and that's actually those are the areas that start to um, show the signs of burnout stress anxiety like and and so it, look, that work needs to be done. It's how the how right. the business chooses to manage it. Like those still, things still need to be done, but it's like, how do you do that better? Like rotate teams, give people a break off of that stuff. Um, celebrate actually, you know, what is, what is given to the business. Show that there's value in that work, that it's not just, oh, you know, that team's just plowing away, plowing away. You know, you'll find in a lot of creative businesses, there'll be one or two clients that basically are paying for the work of 
a lot of the other clients, right? <laughs> um, and it's just not, yeah. it's, it, it, it becomes not that, not that sustainable. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's definitely been, I think back to some of that stuff I talked about earlier where you recognize something like that's going on and you give people a break, but then you put them back in the same situation. Mm. You haven't understood really what's going on. And yeah. so like back to the survey, the, 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 the second round of research that we did, which was at the beginning, literally, I, I think we closed off the survey, like probably the day the planes got grounded for COVID. <laughs> Oh um, yeah. Right. So, so these results were, it was, what was, I guess what's quite good about that is that they were very much industry dynamics, not necessarily, um, you know, what was happening with COVID, but we went back a few months later and then to try and understand the COVID effect, but the industry, like the systemic issues still, still were top. Um, and one of the big things, and this is like one of my, like, like my favorite slide is weird to talk about a favorite slide, isn't it? But, um, the favorite favorite finding in the research was that we asked people what do you want from your the business that you work for to improve your mental health and well-being and so it's a it's basically a very clear ranking system that we got out of that at the bottom of that list and that ranking system are things like uh, motivational posters healthy food and snacks mindfulness sessions yoga at lunch times basically the corporate checklist for improving well-being at work right and it's not to say um, employee assistance programs middle of the list right not to say that they're bad things they're definitely good things to offer as a business like they're not causing problems right they're like nice to have though yeah they're nice to have at the top of the list by absolute country mile was more empathetic and educated leadership. Um, and, and you know, the, the other things that are at the, that are the top of the list, which is like clarity around objectives, right? Now it's, it's really funny because as soon as you go and talk to a business or an employer about mental health and wellbeing, they fall into that checklist, right? And also everything has some sort of, well-being message around it but actually the fundamental things that people believe are contributing to the poorer aspects of their mental health and well-being are the things are, are the everyday parts of work how they interact with each other what their job is whether they feel like they've got the confidence in their job to to do it well whether they feel like they're being heard and understood by their manager the, the top five things in that list none of them said mental health Right. So if, when wow. you think about it, it's the bottom of the list is like the 5% of your work week where, Oh, I got to do yoga at a lunchtime or I managed to grab a banana from the fruit bowl. Um, <laughs> but the 95% of your work week was working with, you know, the, the clients around you who might have yeah. unrealistic expectations or you haven't, you know, done a good enough job at educating how things are going to happen. Um, your, your boss is just not listening to you. Maybe they've got their own stresses and pressures and they just haven't, you know, and also we don't, we don't educate and train people in this stuff. I, I was, we, you know, especially in creative industry, you're not actually brought up to know how to be a good manager. So the people oh. who are good managers and leaders, they are, they're usually the ones that naturally like it's part of their personality type, right? Um, they're social, they're feeling people like they're, you know, they're, they're good at that stuff naturally. And we're all different. And so if you're not like that, you actually have to be, you, know, you have to have your eyes opened to it. And I did, um, so I'm, funnily enough, I've just come off like a two hour call with the coach last night on, on leadership. And um, I know like intrinsically that I'm much more of an action and thinking person than a feeling person. Your eyes to, to all that stuff. Now, you know, I'm 42. And I think that's probably the first intense session that I've had with a coach around leadership. And um, it's, it's, you know, yeah, it's quite eye opening. And obviously, you know, all the work in mental health has helped that as well. Sure. Um, and I did a mental health first aid course two years ago. And for me, I, you know, I'll always tell people that the mental health first aid course was like the best leadership course I've ever done. Um, 
because it just helps you to be more aware of the people around you. So rather than thinking, Oh God, that person's so lazy. They don't get their work done quick enough. Or why can't they do that quicker? Or blah, blah. Yeah. Maybe some, maybe something's happening with them, right? Like maybe there's something outside of work or maybe you haven't done a good enough job of explaining what's required or helping them get to the answer. Um, and it's actually, you know, it's up to you to, to improve those conditions. But we don't train people for that in our industry. And then, you know, guess what? What was it? Something like 80, 85% um, of people say, oh, you know what would improve my well-being at work? Better educated, more empathetic leaders. I mean, so much of that, like, it resonates with me. Um, and I think it's so, like all of it really ties into communication and how like open communication and being transparent is kind of lacking um, within the industry in general. And I understand, you know, as you're getting into a more corporate stage, it's probably becoming even more difficult. Like for us, like we have a very you know, um, horizontal setup, like everything is communicated on uh, Slack, like everybody is like available for something. If I can't respond, somebody else can respond. Um, and everybody like kind of works on their own time. Like we have night owls, like you're down here, who is in Istanbul, but prefers to be in this session right now. Like I'm a night owl myself, um, but we also have like morning people in the team. And it's kind of like getting to know each other's strengths and really understand, um, like what you're going through or where you want to, like, what do you also want to contribute to the team? Like sometimes, and especially the creative landscape is the best place to discover that. Like we have, you know, somebody trained as an architect coming into the team, but then has amazing illustration skills, which, and, you know, doing as their hobby and they love it. And we're like, well, how can we bring that into some of our projects? You know, like your team, if they really reflect into the project like their characters and personalities and things they want to do in life like if that can reflect into the work that they're doing that already you know feels like they're part of it and they're more um aware of what's going on and i and i i think like in one of the interviews that were, that i was doing when we um sort of rebranded and we're introducing sour like i talked a lot about you know like i wish you know going into you know starting an architecture and design studio we saw more architects talking about like, and architecture is an interesting breed of like mix of creative and technical, right? Like there's a lot of both. Um, So there are stages in the project where it gets very tedious and very detail oriented and technical and the project manager can easily be burned out by that. And in our way, like how we balance it, uh, because we have like different typologies of projects, somebody who has been working on a technical side of an architectural project could jump into a product design concept phase in the follow-up route so they don't get stuck in that same routine um but i also you know nobody recommended that to us but it was sort of our like own like discovery as we are you know working with the team and really like getting to know each other like human relationships 101 um but also you know, what you said in terms of like generally, uh, you know, the things that are paying the bills are not necessarily always the most creative projects that you're working on. But like, it it goes a long way if you openly communicate that to the team too. Like if they feel like they're part of the bigger picture and like the conversation, like, oh, like from this project, it's not that cool. We will learn this, plus it will pay the bills. And with that, we can actually do this project or this prototype that we want to self-commission. And it's then it's like you're having a family meeting and decision together, yeah. right? So I think um, you know, the hierarchical model of corporate too, where like sort of not everything should be filtered to the team, like we should. I don't know, maybe sometimes like uh, some supervisors have the intention of protecting the team, but it also comes with a lot of like black boxes, which is very yeah. frustrating. Like what are we working for in the end? And that adds to the stress and anxiety, which is so creates a sick loop. It's, it's almost, I mean, it could, it's almost a, uh, a whole discussion in its own right. Like transparency is, is very interesting. So one of the, bugbears I have and I know not a lot of people don't agree with this but the we we do have we created this huge ladder in our mm. industry right yeah you've got it, it starts at the bottom of like you know you, 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 you know you do have like sort of the the bottom rungs and then you have managers directors you know principals and all, you know, whatever it is yeah but then we create all these other rungs in between those right <laughs> oh, associates junior senior 
senior associate, you know, <laughs> I, I, it's like, and, and the thing is, is, is that, so, so you're taught, you're introduced to the ladder and mm. what you're most interested in then becomes like, Oh, how do I get onto the next run of the ladder? Okay. Right. And actually some of those runs were just created so they don't have to pay you anymore. This is being incredibly cynical. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> created so they don't have to pay you anymore but you feel a sense of achievement and that you're progressing right so often and this is this is true these conversations have happened where you want to pay you go in asking for a pay rise you come out with a title right can't afford to yeah. pay anymore but what i can do is i think you're ready for associate design director and it's like you're not doing anything differently you're not managing more people you're you not probably have more part. work to do but you get to pay yeah. <laughs> Full work, same pay, you get to update your LinkedIn. And I mean, it's good. It's like progress is good. We do need to understand that. But actually imagine what you could get from progress of just being told how well you're doing on a daily basis and being able to be shown like, you know, you're here right now. I think you could be, you know, at this level if you start to show that you're able to do this, this and this. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be, again, like for most people, where, you know, it's not just money and I don't think creators got into this for the money yeah. um, that you, you'd be able to show um, a sense of achievement. And, and that's where, again, you start to get, you know, that's where the rewarding and the self self worth comes in. The transparency side is really interesting because I'm a massive proponent of transparency, but I'm also very aware of, you, you talked about protecting and I think like protecting is good because it kind of comes in from the, like the, a good, a uh, good yeah. source. Um, but yeah, so it's a real balance because transparency sometimes like where you, it's, it's great to be able to show, Hey, how are you part of the bigger picture? This is how you're contributing to the business. But when yeah. you use transparency, you go, you know what? We are really <laughs> struggling right now. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And, you know, we've got about four weeks worth of runway of, uh, of money. Oh. We probably like, does anyone know anyone? Can we get a project? And it's uh, <laughs> that create, what you think you're doing at that point is like yeah. sharing. It's like the teams go through the highs and they go through the lows. <laughs> and the reality is though, is that you've got years of experience to know that, you know what, it, usually all works out in the end right yeah, amazingly uh, i can't a yeah. number of times where you'd look at revenue in the business and you <laughs> yeah. go we're eight weeks from going out of business uh, <laughs> and then guess what a project comes in but yeah. for people that are younger newer to the industry they're like eight weeks from going out of business Shit. <laughs> i better look for <laughs> Do a job I need to go start looking for a job um, and then they go yeah. home and then they like dwell on it and go right well where would i go to from here oh i really love this job Oh, I don't know where, and it like the anxiety that can create yeah. and it comes from a good place because it's like, Oh, I want to be transparent. I want people to understand like they're going to learn great things from this, but you yeah. suddenly like throw them into a massive <laughs> group. And, <laughs> no, it's almost like, you know, you're like informing a toddler and like toddler is just new to life. And then you have uh, two members that are new to, you know, work life. Yeah, exactly. And then you're just like throwing life's facts at them. Like you just yeah. can't, yeah. you like, can prep them and you can be like, I think there's a lot of around like transparency, but with a positive attitude yes. and not yeah. necessarily like, you know, I think positive, like transparency, even also like maybe project based, like project goals. Or yeah. like, why are we doing this? Or like, why are you doing this? Because I'm telling you to work on this. So the reason you're working on this yeah. and rather yeah. instead of just like, you know, um, I'm having also like, you know, it could be very, I'm having a shitty day because this happened and maybe it's like too much information for some yeah. people too. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it's good. And, and also then like, if you are going to do transparency, like do it really, really well. Like there's, um, there's a company called Buffer. You might have, okay. I mean, you've ever heard of Buffer? No. Uh, they, they're, a, they're a software company. They do like social media scheduling tools and stuff like that. Mm. But they're famous for their transparency. You can go on to their Google Drive right now, anyone in the world, and go see their, the salaries. Oh, um, wow. Like that's how transparent they are. But you, when you then listen to them talk about it, um, so much work went into that like how they had to benchmark, how they had to get to those salaries. And so transparency is an amazing thing, but you can't just jump to it overnight. You actually have to work even harder to do transparency yeah. right, rather than it's just go, let's open it up. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> and then <Yeah>. full chaos. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. There's an awesome book uh, called, which is just like the probably one of the best books I've read in the last few years, called Brave New Work mm. by a guy called Aaron Dignan. Um, I think he he was originally a founder of um, Undercurrents, which were quite a sort of pioneering um, was it agency or kind of consultancy um, over in America. But it is all about some of the stuff that we've been talking about, like autonomy, transparency, trusting in your people, um, like working with people to understand that just goals, there, there are just goals that need to be met rather than yeah. processes that need to be done you know like this, yeah. this kind of stuff it's just the, the most amazing book um, i'd love to just send it to everyone yeah oh yeah please yes and we'll definitely mention it um and i guess like you know when we're talking we're also touching upon a little bit of like the, all the solutions that goes with like all these problems and we're talking about you know open communication well you know in an artful way and then transparency and also uh, you know you mentioned empathetic leaders um what do you also think about like we're very big on um like collaboration and really collaboration of different like not only diverse backgrounds but disciplines and we have a lot to learn from each other right i think you know um for example like real estate construction like these industries unfortunately don't have the mindset let's say of like tech technology companies and therefore like the built environment is very behind on innovation and or like compared to like healthcare or you know with you know design fields um as you said like we like if people go into it necessarily not for the money because they're passionate like emotional like creative people and uh then you know suddenly they find themselves in a position where they're being used for their talents but not being paid for whereas if a lawyer or accountant would pick up the phone they would start billing you so we have a lot to learn from each other and to sort of um educate ourselves on what are the you know best practices in that industry which we can adopt to ourselves how do you think like exposure to more like different industry practices like best practices and learning from each other it could sort of help more like collective action around the creative industry itself to sort of create more sustainable solutions so i mean there's definitely opportunities to learn i think um I think that there's also just like a, there's a subset of, of, of people and businesses who just go, we've always done it this way, right? They're actually quite closed off to, to that. And so I think yeah. in a lot, in, in a fair amount of this, there's like some generational change that is happening and those businesses will just die off. And, you know, the people that have been in them and it's, it's almost like this thing where you kind of got to understand the rules before you can break the rules. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you've been in those businesses and you've seen how it works, actually it makes it, you know, you, you come from a better place to be able to step outside of them and go, right, I'm going to do this differently. And uh, it doesn't mean you get it right. Like we, I mean, we, we started our agency having worked for the big kind of holding company agencies for, for a long time. And <clears throat> we purposefully wanted to step out and go, right, none of that. We want to walk away from all of it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the best practice of those, the, you know, the, the profit at all costs, the this, the that, the, the, the way of tracking time, the way of doing everything. Um, and then you realize as you go to break it, there's actually some things that, no, we still need a little bit of that. And we still need a little bit of this. And like, that's actually really important. And there's, you know, there's a reason those companies are multi-billion dollar companies, right? Um, and, but, but as long as you can understand that and then you can start to like riff off of it, then you're actually in a position to be able to, you know, break some of the rules because you understand them better. So I think that, you know, there's pockets of that already just within the industry. Um, but then yes, when you go out, I think, um, and I don't know, like I'm, I'd assume that you, you, you do find this in your industry sometimes, which is yes, there are um, more kind of technicians and the bills and that kind of stuff. But there's also like you're open, you can open their eyes to things and yeah. I, mean, I remember going in to do like big board presentations on brand work to CFOs and, you know, directors and lawyers, it's like th their whole day is that stuff. Right. And then you go in and they're like, Oh, this is fun. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so actually you're like the highlight of their day. And so realizing yeah. that is, is like a good thing, but, but learning from other 
industries, I think is hard until you really know your own industry. Mm. Um, and so like once you really know and you know what it is that you can play with and you know what is kind of un, uh, unforgiving, like you just can't let go of it, then you can actually start to go, well, you know what, I'm going to pick a little bit of that. And so an example of that, um, I think in the creative industry, is the number of creative businesses now that work in sprints. Mm. Okay. So we introduced this into um, our agency when we started. And I was fascinated by silicon valley silicon valley technology software the ways of working the agile manifesto right and i, I would i would sometimes sit and watch the uh, model when we would do like big branding projects for you know the, the biggest companies in in the country and around the world and you go through the same formula and this is how we do it blah blah blah. it takes you know oh you want to rebrand it's like yes great lots of money it's going to take about <laughs> six to twelve months uh, this is the process that we go through and there's, there's good things to that, right? Because it feels safe to the client. It's like, Oh, you know, I'm not going to get fired yeah. for hiring you guys. Right. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've always been a massive fan, uh, right or not, uh, of change and changing things up. And so we, I, I, I was discovering more and more about this agile manifesto. Also it was around the time of like startups and wanting to, you know, bring, uh, you know, like to work with these companies that are thinking differently, but didn't have any money. Yeah. Um, and so like, how do we work with them? And so we looked at um, like developing a sprint model for the way that we worked um, and being able to like take some of those principles and go, well, it isn't about the fact that in my proposal to you, I've got these line items, which are 50 interviews with stakeholders, two surveys, like these, all these like deliverables. It's like by the end of sprint one, we will have an answer to this question. By the end of sprint two, we will have given you confidence around the hypotheses that we have presented. By the end mm. of sprint three, you might start to see some work, right? You mm. might have what you think is traditionally the outcome from work like this. Um, and then you could like you can play with the length of those sprints and so actually the right. like in the most like those small milestones you can control the timing and adapt to that yeah mm. and and even like i used to get um yeah because normally then you'd have a presentation of findings from wave one presentation of findings from wave two like all that kind of stuff right and um we used to have we used to invite clients into the process we used to invite them into the agency and um the staff like it'd be post-its on the wall it would be not particularly like it wouldn't look that great for a long way <laughs> through the project it's all work in progress right it wasn't polish every time yeah. an agency does a presentation it has to be perfect you know so we're yeah. showing them stuff that's crap not crap but you know but it's progress it's progress. progress right and it's good and sometimes i used to do this thing where just to like manage expectations where on the wall i just write 30 percent and it's, I just I want to remind you that what you're seeing today, it's not the finished article. We're thirty percent of the way through the product project, mm. um, and it's important. Like that's quite important for them to understand that it's like, oh God, yeah, you know, okay. Well, at least I got some way to go to try and turn this around, you know. <laughs> um, and we did this on steroids once, uh, which was we we said, um, I wonder if we can do a brand in a day, right? Oh wow, and. Um, I saw this tweet. There was the, the food truck movement had just started in Sydney. And it was like, oh, this is cool. Love food, love, you know, the ability to just like run off and just go and find this truck. And, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was just really, really cool. And the city of Sydney had started to get into it. And there was a guy who um, had a food truck and he said, um, he tweeted, oh, I need a, like a brand designer to help do the brand for my food truck. Um, and this was when I was at Interbrand. So Interbrand, like, pretty much the leading global brand consultancy. Um, and I'm like, oh, I'd love to, love to be able to do that. So I went and met him, had a bit of a chat, took a couple of the team, and we were like, oh, this would be really cool, but there's just no way he can afford us. Yeah. And so um, what we did was we said to him, and I was in, right in the middle of like writing, how do you do sprints in branding? This is like 2010, 2011, I think. And... So we'd worked out, okay, well, you know, we've got to compress stuff. We've got to make decisions quickly. We've got to work with principles, not, you know, outcomes, that kind of stuff. Mm. And we devised a plan for doing his brand in a day, right? And we, we, and he had this like catering space, a kitchen, like a test kitchen. 
and we took 20 people <laughs> with all of the Macs, laptops, post-its, whatever we needed from the office. And we set up in his kitchen slash space on a Saturday and we did a brand in a day. And so, and literally we had like these, these like time zones built in and he was there wow. all the way through the day making tacos for us, which was awesome. <laughs> so you're immersed uh, yourself into the experience. So we're immersed. We were literally in there. Yeah. Um, we, we had to very quickly come within the first two hours, come up with conclusions of like, what direction are we going in? So we split people into teams. Um, some of those teams were multidisciplined. Some of them were specific disciplines. And we started like creating from the beginning to kind of get a sense of where things were. We'd have presentations, like mini presentations every two hours. We would get uh, the leaders of each like circle or group would get together with Attila, who's the, who's the guy, um, every hour and a half to say, hey, we need to make a decision about this. Are you comfortable? Because then we're going to move on from there. And it was just the most rewarding experience. It was so cool. Uh, and pretty much, so I have to tell the truth. We did most of the work in the day. Like we got the direction. We knew exactly where it was going and we had some output and we presented stuff at the end of the day. Then there was, you know, probably about Final eight months back and forward as we tried <laughs> to get it onto the truck and all that kind of stuff. But um, it was, it was really, really good. And it just showed you that like, you know what, there is another way. And then when we yeah. launched our business, it was, it was sprints. It was like, um, and it's my business partner that sort of uh, coins the phrase that we had like work out um, build out and try out and I uh, sorry, work out, try out, build out, work out was like, where we just need to work out what's going on here. Try out was that like, we're going to test a few things, build out, we build a solution. Okay. And mm. it was easy for clients to understand. It was, um, it was also became more about the process than the work at the end. And they, yeah. you know, they loved that. Like we did, um, and we would record everything. So in terms of transparency, like, if nice. a client couldn't come to a session and we were having internal sessions, we'd record them and put them up on like Vimeo. Um, and you know, I had a client, we created a blog every week. We'd put everything up. Um, so, <laughs> but they weren't fancy presentations. Like sometimes they were yeah, arguments, yeah. Um, but they helped bring them along the way of understanding like what you've thought of, what you've discarded. So that like, as a, and I've been a client, like what do you, what you want to know that you, the agency is working for you gets it. Right. Right. Um, right rather than like they walk in and they're trying to distill three weeks of work into an hour presentation and you just left it questions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you know, they're the biggest stakeholder, like it's their identity. And then, yeah. um, it's like having your biggest stakeholder in the process actually creates the best outcome. Yeah. It's like what we talk about, like human centered design all the time. Right. And like, this is actually like the people you're doing the branding for, they're part of the design team almost. Yeah. Um, and so you can yeah. say that, like I get mega excited about that stuff, um, but <laughs> yeah. also it's not for everyone. And that's, that's the other big learning, right? Like, some people will thrive in those situations. Yeah. It's quite high pressure. It's quick. It's challenging. But also there are people who go, oh, my God. What the... Like so much pressure and I'm in this the spotlight. Is, and yeah. and it's then, even and also more like, stressful. Yeah. And then suddenly I've got to present to like the creative director after just an hour of work. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's also understanding, which I didn't you know, even think about then, to be honest. Um, but understanding that like there are as you mentioned before there's different people there's different personality types there's, they, they will process things differently you have to kind of set up to be able to understand that and and the diversity of people in your team yeah you have to realize that just because i, I remember um we've done things like there's this creative exercise called crazy eights right and you have to come up with eight ideas in eight minutes or something like that or five minutes or something um, oh, so wow. you literally just take a piece of paper and you fold it <laughs> into an eight grid and you have to put an idea on each square now some people thrive with that but some of the most talented people i've ever worked with would just not be able to put pen to paper hmm. and you'd go like what's wrong with you how come you can't do this and it's like, well, they just don't work in that way and so you yeah. really do have to understand and this is again it's that empathy thing right have to understand how to get the best out of the people because if you want to create diversity in your team and even with your clients then you have to set up the conditions for it to be successful you can't just go right we're going to do this and yeah. everyone falls in line because you just actually lost 
you know, the, the value of the diversity that you brought in to the process. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, it's really about though, like as a leader, um, you know, being flexible in the ways you work, like, oh yeah, we could have a design script for this project, but not for the other project. And you can sort of, sort of adapt, uh, based on the team that is also working on the project. Like what is the best course of going? Like how would the team thrive in, in this project? And, you know, maybe they prefer working from home, maybe from office, maybe at client space, like yeah. all of the above. And really, which again goes back to again like communication and transparency like how do we want to go about this and maybe this is a decision with the team and i think since a lot of like number like one stuff that we talk about as the industry issue is like mental health as stress and anxiety there is like it goes a long way of like just to have open communication and by like but you know saying that but really sticking to it as you know a leader as well you know like saying like we openly communicate but if the response is not in your best interest you kind of you can't be annoyed by it right you have yeah. to create a safe space to be able to enable that in the team um so it really um it's just i guess like um i don't know how we do that more in the industry like it's like you know going to like therapy sessions as a team of enforcing like there's like more yeah. open communication um but we it's have quite to confronting yeah Right. As a, as a leader to, to get into that, um, like to suddenly then open yourself up and go, right, I'm going to give, I'm going to this passing of control and power, but then yeah. you have to realize that it was your decision, right? So whatever happens <laughs> exactly. to that, if, if something does happen, it's like, it was your decision and that's what you chose to do. Like exactly. you can't, you can't tell the person off for then going and doing it the way they did it. Cause you actually gave them the license to do it. And I think if leaders can understand exactly. that, responsibility but then still be comfortable with handing over control um like i remember we've got <laughs> i went on holiday and um one of the team was putting you know i've handed everything over it's like it's okay you guys make decisions you don't need me and then um i uh i got back from holiday and we were taking a bunch of stuff up to an event and it's just like this you know what's the event offer mm. and um i remember one of the team like it said oh yeah so we've put together the event like here's the flyer that we're going to give out blah blah as a 50 percent off event special i was like 50 percent <laughs> it's quite a lot uh and then but then it's like you know what no worries like that's <laughs> i pass that over to yeah. you you made the decision it's a compelling offer um and 50 percent. and so like you just you have to be comfortable with the fact that those things happen it will happen and like also like what's really what's the worst that comes out of that we get a whole yeah. bunch of new customers brilliant <laughs> you know yeah. and so that's it like you set up like what you want to try yeah. and achieve and and then people go go and do it but you have to be comfortable with that and you have to i think the more we're about to do a research project around to try and do like an empathy audit of the industry Ooh, cool okay and it's quite, it, it, it could be quite, well, it will be quite challenging, but um, there's a few things around how to think about empathy. So one is how the empathy between teams and team members and manager, so internal kind of empathy within a company, mm -hmm. um, the empathy with clients, so the suppliers that you do work for and what the empathy relationship is there. And then the empathy as well with your audiences right the people that actually get to experience and consume the work that you do yeah and so the other thing around this is because it's it's quite i can tell you we asked to present the mental health research at a uh, very big leadership conference um about probably around this time last year oh no middle of last year and uh they said yeah no worries but um just so you know, like there's a, a bit of feedback from some of the leaders um, around, they're a bit over having to talk about mental health. And it's like, oh, you know, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but I'm afraid it's still rather large problem. <laughs> <laughs> and whilst you might be over it, I'm not sure the people, you know, it'd be great if you were over it because it's everything's okay now, but it's not. Yeah. And, um, but so, so, and the reason I bring that up is because like empathy is such a 
I think quite a loaded word for people because it's like, oh, right. you know, we've got to do all this empathy stuff. Like it's a bit soft and, you know, like, oh, we've got to be nice and fluffy and kind yeah. to people, you know. But you know what? I run a business. I've got to get stuff done. And, and so um, the reason as well for just showing how, like, if you can create more empathetic cultures, it actually leads to more empathetic and more successful work right yeah so um there's a there's an agency in um the states who i spent quite a bit of time chatting to last year and actually there's an article i'll send you the link to it um where they did this campaign um and it was called oh, i'm gonna forget what it was called the campaign basically it was all about making sure that you vote hmm. okay um but it was related to gun violence and crime hmm. And what uh, it was McCann Health did this campaign and they did, um, they brought a kid who had been killed through um, a mass shooting back to life. So using AI and um, augmented reality and like bringing, uh, being able to use basically kind of actually like computer game stuff to map and create. Um, yeah. They brought a parent's son back to life to give the message that, hey, I think it's called Unfinished Votes. I think that's what it's called. Um, that To say that I can't vote, um, but you can, and you should, you should vote now um, because there are things like we can stop what happened to me from happening and this kind of stuff. And imagine like the empathy required because it becomes into your work, right? Like now it's not, you, know, yeah. you have to have empathy in dealing with that situation. You have, imagine the first presentation where you are presenting Oof. A, a, a reborn son back to parents um and it's just incredible so so i got to interview and yeah you know, he talked about it every step of the way but just like the impact on the team where you can actually all come together around a common cause and you can yeah. all start to understand like the real meaning of the work that you're doing um and then it just like imagine then even the like the empathy it brings to the way of working Exactly. Um, and like you don't care about to... the deadline then, like you want to get it out there because exactly. it's such a powerful message. Yeah. And obviously not every project can be, let's bring yeah. someone, some back to life, but it starts to instill things in you that like, if this, if empathy can become a way of working right. rather than something that is, Oh, I did that empathy training session. Now I've got to go back to work. You know, it, that's, it, it needs to be 100%. built in it, back to the point of like, whatever we're doing around mental health and well-being, diversity, inclusion, it means nothing if you don't do it. So it affects the 95% of the, of the work that you do. Yeah. It's not, it can't become 5% of the, the bolt on of like, oh, I've done that training. Oh, I've yeah. know, some yoga. Like it's a better, banana from the couch. When you walk into a meeting, it all goes to shit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that, you know, we're sort of wrapping our, uh, up with the notion around like empathy. And I think that this is like kind of like the highlight of the conversation. Um, so I guess with that, you know, like what would your advice be to any young creative who is going into the industry now? And obviously with all the ex existing mm. problems, right? Like they're not going in away anytime soon and will remain in many industries uh, for a while. I mean, we can push for change. Well, how do you, uh, like, what is your advice on navigating that? So, okay, let's, let's go through it. One, change is coming right? and it's happening. <laughs> yeah. It's already happening. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two, you can say no, right? Like, yeah, you, you, more so than ever before, you have the power to say, no, I don't want to, you know, I don't need to work in this environment. Um, mm -hmm. I don't believe things need to be done this way. Um, and, and I think that's like a big, like there's a lot of empowerment there. And you might, sometimes you might not be able to do that as an individual, but look around you, talk to people, join a community. Like you'll find that there's a lot of people go, yeah, you know, don't, don't, don't have to do that. You know, like if you don't, if it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. Yeah. And like having, like if you can find almost this kind of like pack to, to go with you through that journey, then it's going to help you. And there are like amazing communities out there. So you know, obviously have to plug never not creative, um, but also <laughs> yeah. for designers, like the design kids, it's just an amazing supportive community. You can find mm. them on, on Facebook. They've got chapters in different cities and that kind of stuff. Um, go to things like creative mornings where you can chat to, you know, like-minded people. I'm sure as well for like architects, there's, there must be something similar over here. There's um, a great uh, blog 
by a guy called Warwick uh, Mihaly. Uh, it's called Panfilo, the blog, P-A-N-F-I-L-O. And he just shares everything he's ever learned about running a, an architecture practice. Wow. Uh, and they just launched a podcast as well, actually. In fact, he'd probably make a great guest. Me, uh, Warwick, yeah. <laughs> Warwick is awesome. He's so good. Um, so there's, there's that. And then there's also like find the pockets of change and do your bit to help yeah. further them. Right. So, um, this, that they can't just exist with like a few people pushing the agenda. Um, yeah. it, it's got to be like, you know, it, you have the opportunity, even though you're like getting just maybe just getting a start in the industry to give back already. It used to be that you have to wait till you're, you know, 42 to give back. Um, but actually now you can become part of that change straight away. So we've, we've launched initiatives in the last year and a half. Um, one, we have mentally healthy minimum standards for businesses in our industry. Um, they're not massive aspirational things. They're not like, hey, you, people come into work and everyone you know, starts the meeting with opening up about their days and how we've done and then we build that into it. It's not that. It's like if someone discloses a mental health problem at work, you have to make reasonable adjustments for them so that they can still do the work that they're doing. Some of the things actually are employment law in, in Australia and, and probably in some other countries, right? Um, and so that's, that's one. So mentally dash healthy.org has minimum, the minimum standards, um, over a hundred businesses have signed those, those minimum standards. We've taken that model and we've done it for internships. So we now have internship minimum standards. Um, and the thing with that is one, making sure that interns get paid. Yeah. So I mean, we could talk about that for another hour, but, um, <laughs> yeah. internships getting paid is very, very important. Uh, for every reason diversity comes into that conversation like if if you're not creating um opportunities for people to get paid then you're only allowing certain people to be able to access the industry yeah so mega important um and we have internship minimum standards so the other thing is like you know it can't be a case of uh you come in as an intern and then someone goes oh shit the intern's here has anyone got any work for them to do (laughs) right (laughs) happens a lot okay yes unstructured internships when what we're meant to be doing is giving people the best possible start in their career so yeah. that's part of it as well um and then there's we're just about to launch so probably by the time this comes out it might have launched um international women's day is coming up and yeah. you know you, you mentioned um like the challenges for 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 well i guess working mums um but also you know women in general in the industry and so we have created an event that never stops so it's called never not international women's day <laughs> and you better find it at nevernotcreative.org um, but it's, it launches the day after or has launched the day after international women's day and it will never stop until we don't really need it anymore oh, and I love it that. is a, a 24 7 365 loop of talks from people talking about and trying to educate people around how to improve um, outcomes and opportunities and conditions for women, um, not even just in our industry, actually, it's kind of broadening out quite a lot. Um, yeah. We've got speakers from all over the world and we just, we just want it to be a resource for people to be able to go, oh, you know what, like I can do this better. Um, I should do it better. Um, there's topics like um, this, <laughs> Jess Lilly has submitted a talk called Never Not International Women's Day Until John Stands Down. So quite confrontational, which is basically to the fact that there are more CEOs called John than there are female CEOs. Yeah. And so there's, there's talks like that, but then there's also talks around just like people discussing, like, how do we get more women's names on the door? Like how do we help more women founders? Um, and that kind of stuff. So there's uh, yeah, we, it, we think that that is hopefully going to be a really good resource for people, but basically I, I, the biggest thing around never not creative is like, we want to create change. We don't just want to create more conversation and talk. And yeah. if you want to see change, you have to be a part of it. And that's a big part of, of this community. Like it's not, if, if you're just liking posts and you're just going, oh, that's nice. Did you see what, you know, so-and-so did? It's like, be part of the change. Uh, you can yeah. start with just sharing it or you can get further on and get involved and help create it. Um, and and yeah. we have these change groups that we set up for different initiatives and they are not driven by who you are and what role you occupy. They're driven by how much do you want to get involved? 
are you, you know, like, are you passionate about this as a theme? And so therefore you're in and you therefore you're like, you're suddenly in a group with like creative directors and you might be a student um, just because that's, that's the makeup of the, of the group. Yeah. Um, and then finally, if you, if you are struggling with anything, don't like the, the, the world is getting better. It is okay to speak up in the majority of cases. So please do speak up, find people that you, you, you will find. And our research proved this. If more than half of the industry is showing mild to severe signs of anxiety and depression, there is a very good chance that the person you turn to has experienced yeah. something that you're going through. They might yeah. look on the outside like everything is fine, um, but there's a very high chance that they are, they are experiencing um, something similar. If not them, the next person. Yeah, in the US, one out right? of two. Yeah, exactly. So it's really important to remember. We we set up um, Never Not Creative set up um, an initiative called Circles last year. And we, it's a mental health support group for creatives and it's, it's one-on-one. -on -one. We meet twice a month. Uh, one of those sessions is around your career and you know, anything that you want to just talk about within a group of like-minded, so I guess, professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other one is a, is like a mental health education uh, topic and the chance to talk about, you know, what you're going through and how you're feeling and sharing different coping mechanisms. And we've now done it. We've been going for three months now. And we've just hit this point in the last session where people start sharing um, how they cope with things. And then we come back on, like we've got a Discord set up and you come back onto Discord and they start, go, ah, you know what? I just did that this morning for the first time ever. And it's just, it's made a really big difference. I started my day, you know, in a, in a much more positive manner and all this kind of stuff. And it's just, it's, it's that support group is there to kind of help people out. So yeah, there's, there, there's a lot more happening than there used to be. I wish you know, some of this stuff existed when, when I was coming up in the, in the industry, but you know, the industry has changed. Um, yeah. The way of working's changed. The way of leading has changed. Society has changed, you know, there's, there's, for much of the flaws that do exist, yeah. it has changed. It has got better. There's still a long, long way to go, but you know, there's every opportunity for you to be part of that, that change. Yeah. So, to sort of sum it up, first, um, we're saying, um, you know, say no. It's okay to say no and speak up. There's a mm -hmm. very likely chance of somebody in the room also is going through what you're going, so you're not alone and you don't have to go through it alone. And really, like, I guess to talk about, like, change, like, the patience around it, right? Like, progress is like a relay race almost. Like, but you need to do your part in order to, to contribute contribute yeah. to it and not just you know passively observe but really like yeah. take part in the, in the conversations or take action as you said so do your part and speak up I'll, yeah. I'll i love that analogy <laughs> that analogy is great the relay race you are part uh, of this uh, massive uh, relay race i will credit hillary clinton for that yeah oh, okay yeah okay yeah. thanks hillary. you could have you could have kept that i don't know whether everyone knew that did they <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I think like there's an amazing documentary um, on her on Hulu and uh, she sort of talked, I mean, she did, I mean, not everybody loves her and she's like a yeah. criticized public figure uh, by, you know, for, right, the, for the right reasons. But at the same time, what she did for a woman throughout her entire career is really like a great example of how this is a relay race. I mean, there's a reason why we have a female vice president right now. And yeah. she may not have been the president, but she definitely pushed the conversation by just being present and showing mm -hmm. and speaking up to bullies. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so yeah, and that's so just like, thank you for uh, that analogy. And um, thank you, Andy, for joining the conversation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and you guys have so much great content that we do encourage everyone to follow. Um, and we are also looking forward to, or maybe has started, um, the Never Not International Women's Day uh, because we ha do have a majority female team. So <laughs> thank That's you, great. Andy. That's great, a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Take yes, care. Bye. Thank you so, so much for watching this week's episode. If you found value in these conversations, please like our video and hit the subscribe button. Make sure to visit our website, podcast.whatswrongwith.xyz and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts so you never miss an episode. Please leave us a comment or review, or you can simply tell your friends about us. For more details on our guests, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. You can find our handles in the description below. And don't forget to join us next week. See you.